believe we have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination except we have been called by his name. Oh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. If you have your Bibles and would stand with me tonight, we are going to continue a series that we started last Wednesday night on the spirit world, the spirit world. And I did ask for those that are doing the uh, media uh, on the screen, I did ask for them to make sure that's a little, little S because I am not talking about God's spirit, big S. I'm talking about um, angels and uh, fallen angels is where I'm actually going to in this, this Bible lesson. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and we'll begin reading at verse number 3. Again, let me say as you're looking for that passage, if this is your first time to be at the First Apostolic Church, we welcome you. We are so glad that you made this your place of worship. If you are one of those returning guests, we uh, thank you for coming back and being with us. And if you're one of those that the last few months you've just made First Apostolic Church home, we welcome you. We welcome you to the family and we welcome you to the fellowship here at First Apostolic Church. Um, uh, Pastor mentioned a little bit about being gone. Uh, Sister Carpenter and myself were honored to sit with uh, seven of the major uh, leaders of the oneness movement in St. Louis and there discuss better ways that we can come together, better ways that we can um, become, become one as the church is truly one. I got news for us all. The church is one. The organizations may not be one, but His church is already one. We just have to figure out how to get to where we need to be. On Friday night, we had the very first, y'all know that several months ago, Ferguson, Missouri was uh, like a battle zone, a war zone. And uh, on last Friday night, we held an all-night prayer meeting. And uh, the seven uh, leaders of the organizations preached uh, throughout, throughout the night. And uh, it was absolutely awesome. I got the floor. I think I hold the world record. Now, you know, if you're here tonight and you're a preacher, you know what I mean when somebody will say, well, I got the floor two hours after the service started. And I got the floor three hours after the service started. I got the floor... The service started at 6 p.m. And they turned the floor over to me at 3 a.m. in the morning to preach. And uh, you know what? It's amazing. We had a good time. God moved. And the spirit of prayer come upon us. And we prayed. And it was such a... Because we want to turn back the darkness in our world. And if prayer cannot turn back the darkness, we can't be helped. But aren't you thankful that prayer can turn back the darkness tonight? So very, very, very thankful. So very thankful for that. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 3. Paul said, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Tonight I'm going to take just those four words. God of this world. And that's what I want to teach on tonight. The God of this world. Jesus, anoint your servant tonight. Lord, you called me. Lord, you've anointed my heart. And I ask you tonight, Lord, that you would touch me one more time. God, give me strength in my body. Give me clarity in my mind. Lord, the, the way that I show you that I love you is to feed your sheep. Lord, help me tonight to feed this church. Help me, oh God, tonight to feed them your word. Lord, I'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you go ahead and clap for the word of God tonight? Clap in honor of God's word tonight. Such an awesome people. 
Such a wonderful people tonight. You may be seated. You know, I very seldom, I very seldom read from other translations, but there's a couple of other translations that I would like to read from tonight. Um, I do believe that the King James Version is the safest as far as when you want to study truth, when you want to, when you want to establish truth, you, you, need, you need to have a King James Version. But there's other versions that do not take away from truth that actually can kind of bring to light at, uh, a little bit brighter for us to, to comprehend. And this is one of the versions, and it's the Message Bible. And it just simply says, If our message is obscure to anyone, it's not because we're holding back in any way. No, it's because these other people are looking and going the wrong way and refuse to give it serious attention. All they have eyes for is the fashionable God of darkness. The fashionable God of darkness. That's a, that's a pretty neat way. That's a pretty neat way to uh, describe Satan. He is uh, the fashionable God of darkness. Another, another um, passage of scripture that I would like to read is in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and uh, verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 14. The God of this world, that word their world is age. The God of this age. 2 Corinthians 11 and 14, Paul says, and no marvel. In other words, he says, don't be shocked at what I'm about to say don't be puzzled don't marvel at what I'm about to say for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light now this happened in the garden of Eden when Satan came offering information or new information to Eve he transformed himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, he says, don't marvel at what I'm about to say, for Satan himself transformed himself into the appearance of an angel giving Eve new information. And then he said, that being so, his ministers, his ministers, everyone say his ministers. Now it's there in the Bible. The Bible says, and be transformed as the ministers of right, his ministers. Let me go up a, a, a line. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers. You ever gave any thought? We understand God has ministers. But we've ever gave, given much thought that, Brother Orr, that Satan too has ministers. He also has ministers who have transformed themselves as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to to their works. You see, there's something about the deceptiveness of sin and the deceptiveness of Satan is that you don't get your eyes open until it's too late. You don't really get your eyes open until he's got you in its, his clutches. Now again, I'd like to read from a different translation of 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. It says, and no wonder, Satan does it all the time, dressing up as a beautiful angel of light, so it shouldn't surprise us when his servants masquerade as servants of God, but they're not getting by with anything. 
they will pay for it in the end. You see, we must understand tonight, church, that Satan is the master of disguise. Satan is an imposter. He is the master of disguise. He's an imposter. Um, he is one that, that comes as, and I, I, I put down the word what an imposter is. An imposter is a person who pretends to be someone else for the purpose of deception. He's an imposter. He comes however he comes. He comes as one offering information. He comes as one offering light and enlightenment. I uh, got a little chuckle today. My son was getting a haircut. and I guess the church standards came up with the lady that was cutting his hair. She began to say, you, you mean to tell me that if you went water skiing, you'd wear long pants? And I think before he could say yes... She said, and I guess you're going to tell me you can only get married once. <laughs> you see, we've got to understand, Satan wants to come and bring us light as if we don't have enough light. Can I tell you as a child of God tonight, one way to leave the window and the door open for Satan is not to realize you have the light. You have the truth. The whole truth. Nothing but the truth. So help you God, right? One way to keep the door locked and keep Satan out is to let anyone know, I've got the truth. I know the truth. I'm content in what I've got because what I have is the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, Satan is an imposter. He is a great master of disguise. And um, he has to give a cheap imitation. He always has to counterfeit. Now, I want you to understand, this is something we need to really hear tonight. Satan counterfeits. Every real thing God has. For example, God has love. As a matter of fact, God doesn't have love. God is love. But what does Satan bring? Right up beside it. Almost appears like, feels like, but it's not. It's a counterfeit. It's an imposter. It's lust. A lot of times lust and love. Go down the same path. But you can pick out love and you can pick out lust. Because lust always serves the individual when love goes out and subs serves the other person. Lust only says me, I, mine. But love says ours, we. So every real thing that God has, Satan has got to have a counterfeit to it. For example... For example, tonight, God became flesh. Amen? God became flesh. We call that, we understand what it's talking about when it says God sent His Son. We know that He's not talking about sending another person. We know that God became flesh and that flesh was the Son of God. As God sent His Son... Jesus into the world, so Satan shall send Antichrist into the world. As God was in Christ, Satan is in the Antichrist. Look at that masquerade. Look at that counterfeit. God became a man. God became the son of man, the son of God. Satan flips right around and knows if I'm going to work in this earth. That's what God, that's the reason God became a man. That's the reason God became flesh. Is because God wanted to do a work that he could only do through a human body. 
And so Satan flips right around and says, okay, if God will do that, then I will counterfeit that with an antichrist. And I, I will be inside of that man of sin. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. As quickly as you can, put that on the screen for me, please. Look at 1 Timothy 3, 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. That word godliness is godlikeness. Great is the mystery of godlikeness. What is the mystery? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Who was? Who was manifested in the flesh? God was. Who was justified in the spirit? God was. Who was seen of angels? God was. Who preached to the Gentiles? God was. Who was believed on in the world? God was. Who was received up into glory? God was. It's called the mystery of godliness. But let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 3. Because if we have the mystery of godliness, I'm interested in how Satan will counterfeit this. How will Satan masquerade the mystery of godliness? What will he bring to us? 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Talking about the Antichrist. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Or that is worshipped. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. Look at that. Now God became flesh. And God came to this earth to die for our sins. Through the body of the man Christ Jesus. God did this marvelous work for us. But Satan has to become the imposter. He has to masquerade. He has to, be, he has to also fill a man. That man will oppose everything about Christianity. Oh, friend, I believe we're feeling the winds of this. I said, I believe we're feeling the winds of this. This Antichrist spirit, this Antichrist man will oppose. What did it say? He opposeth, who, verse 4, who opposeth and exalted himself. Now, I mentioned this to my wife today. It's amazing to me how, how relevant the Bible is. Because the Bible deals with sin and the nature of sin. The only way the Bible's not relevant to you is for you to change your view of sin. If you change your view of sin, the Bible is not relevant. This is an old fogey pastor tonight. This is an old group of people that are locked into a cultural war and all, all of this. But if you still maintain that sin is sin, then things are irrelevant to you when they come out of the Word of God. You see, go ahead and clap for the Lord tonight, would you please? Here he is in verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And simply put, simply put, simply put, the church is standing in the way of the Antichrist. And as long as we are here, he cannot put full throttle down. Now to me, that's why I want to go in the rapture. 
Because if that old boy doesn't have his the pedal to the metal right now, heavens be it, I don't want to be here when he can. Because I don't know about you, we're already messed up in this world. Wars, rumors of war. And, and we get a small glimpse of it, but this world is in trouble tonight. This world is in trouble tonight. And the only thing that's keeping the horrible, perverted minds from taking over is a group of people called the church. And as long as the church is here, hell has to recognize the church and the power of the church. I submit to you tonight the name of Jesus is the only thing that can stop a devil. The name of Jesus is the only thing that can turn the tide. What our nation needs is a Holy Ghost revival. That's what our nation needs. But our nation can never get a Holy Ghost revival if the church doesn't have a Holy Ghost revival. But wait a minute now, wait a minute. Satan is a great imposter. He's a, he, he is a, 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 he's just a phony. He's an imposter. Look at verse number seven. For the mystery of iniquity. That's Satan. The mystery of lawlessness. That's Satan. But what is our God to us? He's the mystery, Sister Lee, of godliness. Can I ask you tonight, which do you want to partake of? The mystery of godliness or the mystery of iniquity? I submit to you tonight, I'm on the road with the mystery of godliness. I don't want nothing to do with the mystery of iniquity. Now, but again, now I've got to tell you, Satan has to mimic. He has to counterfeit. He has to be the imposter of every real thing that God has. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Somebody say, praise the Lord. Now again, you might want to write that down. Which you want to be in? You want to be in the mystery of godliness? Or do you want to be in the mystery of iniquity? You want to be in the mystery of godliness. Now look at Matthew 16, verse 18. Jesus said, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build, please notice this, not the church, not the church. Say it with me. My church. There's a difference between the church and my church. Because he is saying there, it's mine. I own it. And I'm going to show you why he owns it in just a moment. Upon this rock I will build, say it with me. My church. My church. Whose church is it? Jesus' church. I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now why is it my church? Well, Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, will tell us why he can say, Upon this rock I will build my church. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. Tell me Jesus is not God. He said upon this rock I will build my church. And then he said feed the church of God. Why is it his? How did he get a church which he hath Purchased with his own blood. That's what bought the church. The blood of the spotless lamb purchased the church. That's how rare the church is. That's how privileged we members ought to feel. Because we have not been redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. But with the spotless blood of the lamb without spot or without blemish. Aren't you glad you're in something tonight that's so rare? Well, how do you get into this church? Well, Acts chapter 2, 40, 47. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse number 47. The church was praising God. Acts chapter 2, 47, the church was praising God 
having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Yes, who adds to the church? Oh, our outreach is something. Oh, all the things that we do. Christian schools, daycares, all the functions that we're doing. You didn't mention my spotlight tonight either. I want my spotlight if you can get my spotlight out there, all right? Are they not going to let us do it? Okay, all right. Okay, we'll talk about it later. But I want one of them big lights. I want one of those big lights, you know. I don't want any little blow up guys flipping around. I want some big, I want some big lights, all right? All those things are wonderful. TV, webcasting, all that's great. None of that can add to the church. I said none of that can add to the church. It can get people in our parking lot, but I got news for you. It takes God to add them to the church. It takes God to add them to the church. Verse, chapter, not chapter, 1 Timothy 3.15. 1 Timothy 3.15, listen to Paul speaking to the young pastor. He says, Timothy, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. You know what this church is? You know what the church is? The church is the house of God. Not just simply the cinder blocks building. But we, we have become the house of God. We are the temple of the living God. Now read on. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 14. I want you to see this please. Revelation 3 and 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now I want, to, I want to tell you something. That is the last time, under the angel of the church, that is the last time in your Bible that you will hear the word church used. Church is never used again in your Bible. And the answer is very simple. Something happens to verse to, ch- to the church in chapter 4, verse 1. Something happens. Would you get me Revelation 4 and 1? And it says in Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 1, Church is never mentioned again for the rest of the Bible. After this I looked, and behold a door was opened in heaven, And the first verse, uh, voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither, I will show you things which must be. That's the rapture. And I'm not going to take a lot of time on that, but that's the rapture. That's why you never hear the word church used again. That's one of the main reasons I do not believe that the church goes through tribulation all right because after you get to chapter 4 and chapter 5 chapter 4 and 5 is the throne room of God after that tribulation comes to the earth that's one of the main reasons that I believe the church will feel the winds of tribulation but the church will not go through the tribulation because we are God's church we are. What does, name, what, does the, what does the name church mean? Now, can I just say this tonight to you? To some folks that think they're super spiritual and, and they just really don't agree with that statement, why don't you go ahead and start praying for you to go through the tribulation? I mean, just go ahead and start asking God, God, I really don't want to go on the first load out. I mean, you don't hear the church again. I mean, if the church was in one of the vials, if it said, and the church of Laodicea, or if church, I'd have to say the church is there, and we're going to go through, but God's grace will protect us and keep us. But it's simply not there. What does the name church, what does the word church mean? It means called out of. We are called out of the world. 
We are called out. That's what we are. We're called out. That's why the church is a holy church. Because we are called out of the world, but we're called unto God. That's why we're referred to as holy people. We have come away from what we once were, and we are going toward our God. And that's why we're referred to as holiness, as holiness people. But now, you never hear the word church again. And you'd never hear of it again. But in Revelation 22, 17, you hear, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. You don't hear church again. After chapter 3, you don't hear church again. But all the way at the end of the Bible, you hear the word bride. What's happened? The church, the called out, the engaged, the espoused bride of Christ. You see, when a girl gets engaged, she'll go around saying, I'm engaged. Or a boy will go around saying, I'm engaged and all that. But when the wedding has happened, they don't go around talking about being engaged anymore. She's the bride on that day. He's the bridegroom on that day. She's the wife on that day. He's the husband on that day. So you know what's happened between chapter 3 and chapter 22? When we were raptured in chapter 4, we went to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we went from being engaged. We went from being espoused. We went from being just a called out group of people. We changed our identity. We're not known as the church in heaven. We're known as the Lamb's wife in heaven. We're known as the bride of Christ in heaven. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have anything to do with the mystery of iniquity. I want to have everything to do with the mystery of godliness because I want to be in the church. The church. But now we're talking about that slimy, deceptive Satan. He can't have a church. He can't have a called out. But what does he have? What does, what does the enemy have? Would you turn to Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 9? And then Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 9. Listen, listen to what he says in Revelation 2 and 9, talking to one of the churches. He says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do you see that slew foot? He wants to mimic everything God does. He's an imposter. He's a counterfeit. God has a plan of becoming man. Satan says, oh, I'll have a plan of filling a man and he'll be the Antichrist. God says, I've come to buy a church. I've come to purchase called out people. Satan says, the closest I can get to it is a synagogue. Now, before anybody would dare think that I'm, I'm, I'm saying any person that, that, that goes to a synagogue is a Satan worshiper, stop right there. That's not where we're at. We're reading the scripture that while writing to one of the churches, he says to one of the churches, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. See, evidently these are people that say they are. All right? People who profess. They say they are. Everybody say, say they are. They say they are. They say they are Jews and are not, but are, but are the synagogue of Satan. What is a synagogue? According to the Greek word, it's to lead together, to collect, to convene, especially to entertain, to be hospitable, to assemble, to come together, to come and lead, to take in. Can I tell you, there's a big difference 
in synagogue and church. Because the church has never been a place for entertainment. Do we have fun? You better believe we have fun. Do we enjoy our salvation? Do we enjoy our Jesus? You better believe we enjoy Him with holy laughter. And we enjoy Him with joy unspeakable and full of glory. But this is not a place of entertainment. This is not a place that we come to get our flesh entertained. We understand that we must keep our flesh in subjection. We must keep under our flesh. Because if serving God ever becomes entertaining to your flesh, we're not serving the right God. We're not serving the right God. Your flesh is never going to throw up the white flag and, and surrender. As far as I'm concerned, you're going to battle your flesh until the day that you breathe your last breath of air. But you see, that's what the church is all about. The church is not an entertainment center. The church is not a gathering together of people. A gathering together of people doesn't make a church. I don't care how many people attend. I don't care how many services they've got to have. I don't care how big and grand and glorious it is. A crowd of people doesn't make a church. If a crowd makes a church, Neyland Stadium has the largest church in America. But because there's a crowd there, it doesn't make it a church. They've come to be entertained. They've come for their team to win. They've come simply for entertainment. But a church is a gathering of people that have been called out of sin and called out of the world. We have been called out of what we used to be. We have been called out and we have gathered together to discuss how can we get more in love with Jesus. How can we keep on following after Jesus Christ. It appears to me Jesus has a church. Satan has a synagogue. You know what's interesting? You know what's interesting about this? Revelation 3 and 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews. There we go again. And are not. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound relevant to anybody? I believe it sickens God's stomach to hear people go around and say they are believers, but they deny Him in their works. I believe it sickens God to His core when people go around and want to profess that they know Jesus and they know Him, but yet their works totally deny Him. See how relevant this is? If you have truly come in contact with the living Lord, if you have truly had a relationship with the living Lord, you are coming out of that sin. You're not staying in that sin. You don't want to be like that anymore. You don't want to live that life anymore. Can I get a witness in this house tonight? You don't, want to, you don't want to live that way. So just to go around saying, well, I'm a Christian and I'm a Christian and you're cussing every other word, you need salvation. You need praying through. Well, I'm a Christian, but, but, but you're frequenting porn shops and all this. You need salvation. You go around and say, well, I profess Christ, but you know I, I'm this and I'm... No, no, no. When you get true Bible salvation, you are born again. You are called out. Oh, I'm feeling a little bump in the atmosphere here tonight. Surely the apostolic church knows that. Surely the apostolic church knows that when you're truly born again, you come out of that. I mean, our white-headed saints of God, when they came to God, they didn't put a gone-to-lunch sign in the door for Satan to read. They put a gone-out-of-business sign in the door. They didn't hang it up and say, I'll be back in 30 minutes, devil. They hung a gone-out-of-business. They laid their pipes down. They laid their chewing tobacco down. They laid their alcohol down. They busted up their moonshine steels. They did everything. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of the church. I want to be a part of the called out. I don't want to be a synagogue entertaining. <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting tonight. Verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, 
which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and to worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Interesting enough, you never hear the word synagogue again in the Bible. The same chapter of which you never, please stay with me now, the same chapter of which you never hear the word church mentioned again is the same chapter that you never hear the word synagogue mentioned again. How is that? It's simple. Satan is not going to imitate something that's not him. Hey, he's a, he's a brighter devil than that. He's not, over in the, he's not over in tribulation saying, hey, I'm a Jew, hey, I'm this, hey, I'm that, hey, I'm... No, 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 because the church is already gone. They're blending together in one world religion. He drops that sign. He says, hey, I use the, I use the fake, phony facade and posture of a church. Jesus had a church. I've got a synagogue. I no longer need it because he no longer has a church. He has a bride. I don't have a bride. I'm trying to damn people to hell. So he drops the synagogue and he goes to work. You see, Jesus has a bride. Jesus has a wife. We are his wife. The best Satan can do. Jesus has a wife. Satan has a harlot. I see, I guess we can know. I want to be a part. Let me go back to my beginning. I want to be a part of the mystery of godliness. Not the mystery of iniquity. I want to be the church. Not the synagogue. I want to be his wife. Not Satan's harlot. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. He wants a glorious church. And the analogy of not having a spot means you're too close to what's splattering. If mama's frying bacon on the oven on, on, on the stove, if you don't want a grease stain on your shirt, don't get too close to the stove. If we're children of God and we want to have a clean garment, don't be so close to where the world is splattering. Because if you try to get close to the world, you're going to end up with a spot on you. I don't want to get too close to the world. Come on, Pastor. Come on, Pastor. Tell me not to be close to the world. I don't want the... A few years ago, there was some boys here in the church came to me and asked me. There was a, a new drink out, a new alcoholic beer, a new, a new non-alcoholic drink out. It was called Near Beer. And they came to my office up on the hill and they said, Pastor, can we drink Near Beer? It's non-alcoholic. I said, no. Why? I said, it sounds too much like Near Lake of Fire. Huh? They brought, somebody come in and try to tell me a little container of chicken from Hooters. And I said, well, what, 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 what in the world? Oh, they got good chicken. I said, you stay away from that place. You stay away from there, friend. You don't know, no child of God needs to be going to that establishment. I said, no child of God ought to be going to that establishment. The colonel's been working just fine for years. Come on now. You don't need to be going to that place. (laughs) 
I said, can we buy some near beer? I said, no. Why? I said, it's near like a fire. I don't want to buy anything near, near beer. No, get away from it. You're going to get a spot on you. And I guarantee that near beer was probably sold right beside beer. Don't let your good be able spoken of. That's right. It's a church without a spot. You get a spot when you get too close to what's splattering. Have you some distance there. Or a wrinkle. You know how you get a wrinkle? You sit too long. That's how you get your garments wrinkled. You sit too long. That's how, that, that, that's, how you get, that's how you get the back of your coat wrinkled. I try not to wear my coat if I drive over here to church. I try not to wear my coat because if I sit on the back of my coat, it gets wrinkled. And a lot of folks got some wrinkles in their garments of praise because they've been sitting on them too long. You don't need no wrinkle in your garment of praise. It needs to be pressed. Yeah, it needs to be pressed. You don't need no wrinkle in that garment of praise. Be moving. Let arthritis slow you down. Let sickness slow you down. But for God's sake, don't let carnality slow you down. Let a disease slow you down, but don't let carnality slow you down. Let arthritis slow you down, but don't let, a, don't let carnality slow you down. As long as you've got breath, as long as you can wave them hands and clap them hands and stomp them feet, you do it for God. You don't need to get any wrinkles. Yeah. You hear me? The Bible said, well, a glorious church without spot, without wrinkle. I know what a spot is. You know what a spot is? I know what a spot is. You know what a wrinkle is? I know what a wrinkle is. Or any such thing. Does anybody know what any such thing is? It's in the Bible. It's in the, I, I, help me, God, I'm not making this up. It's right there in the Bible. You see... We need to be in so much in love with our husband, Jesus Christ, that we don't want a spot. And we don't want a wrinkle. And we want to be so close to pleasing him that I don't want even such thing. Any, any such thing. It's not a wrinkle, but it's not a spot. But it just don't belong. But that it should be holy and without blemish. And that's what I want to be. I want to be the bride. But now, you don't want to be, you don't want to, really have anything to have to live up to you can turn on over to Revelation chapter 17 and verse number 1 and it says and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me come hither I will show thee the judgment of the great I'm sorry children of the great whore that setteth upon many waters whom with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sit up on a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color decked with gold, precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Can I tell you something? What are you going to be? Are you going to be the Lamb's wife? Are you going to be concerned with your life? Are you going to be called out of sin? Are you going to work? Are you going to do your very best and then depend upon God's Spirit to do the rest? Are you going to do your very best to turn from evil? Are you going to do your very best to wash your robes in the blood of the Lamb? When you sin, are you going to do your very best to find an altar and say, God, help me? And I'm telling you, friend, I don't believe, I don't, I don't believe in this stuff that, that, you know, we're going to sin less or more every day. You get that main, main, uh, mentality in your mind and you'll just sin and we'll use 
use this altar as a drive through around here but I do believe you can fall and keep getting back up enough times and I am listen I am a testimony tonight when I got into church I'd love to have the testimony that some of you had that when you got the Holy Ghost God took the cigarettes away from you and God took the desire away from you I wish I could get up I was 16 years old smoking two packs of Winston a day I wish I could tell you the night I fell out talked in tongues that a few hours later I didn't have that same desire come back and I fell to that desire but you know what somebody preached to me it's not how many times you fall that counts it's how many times you get back up it's how many times you get back up and so within about a six month period of time I kept getting back up I kept getting back up I found myself getting enough pray, praying through on Sunday night that I went a whole day but then I fell Tuesday but I got back up on Wednesday and then I found myself going Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday and then I fell Thursday but I got back up and I kept getting up until one day it did not have the hold but I had to get up I'm telling you tonight, whatever's got a hold of your life, get on your knees. Pray about it. Tell God you want to please Him. Tell God you don't want to live that way anymore. <laughs> that devil, that devil has to mimic everything that God has. God's got a church. He's got a synagogue. God's got a plan of becoming flesh. Satan's got a plan of filling a man. He's the Antichrist. God's got a church. Satan's got a harlot. God's got a cup. Satan's got a cup. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 16. The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar. What shall I say then? That the all idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say... That the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. What's the cup of the Lord? It's the communion in His blood. What's the cup of the Lord? It's His body. We are made one with His blood. We are made one with His body. His body put together both Jew and Gentile and made us one. We are one church because of the spilt blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ. But the harlot, the woman with cup in her hand, that's a cup of devils. You know what that cup is full of? False doctrines. She is the mother of harlots. She is a religious system. She is a religious system that was birthed. You ask me sometimes, what's so wrong with different doctrines that seem to be so innocent? Keep pulling the thread. Keep tracing it back. It's not what you see right now. It's where it came from. And why do you want to drink out of a harlot's cup when you can come and drink out of the Lord's cup? Why would you?
would you want to come and drink? Somebody said, well, somebody said, well, that church, you know, it's got the spirit in it, but it's got some false doctrine. It's got some good in it. They do good. They feed the poor. They do all that. I understand that. But none of us want to eat out of a garbage can. Why would you want to go through a garbage can to pick out what you eat and put the trash over the side? Why don't you just come to the Lord's table and the Lord's table doesn't have junk in it and the Lord's table doesn't have false doctrine on it and the Lord's table is pure and the Lord's table is holy. Why don't you just want to come to the Lord's table? I close tonight with this. And oh, how I wanted to end five minutes early. I'm not a big promoter of this. I just can't be teaching one moment and stop and say, come and let's pray. Let's have a word of prayer and be dismissed. I always think we need to have a few moments after the preached word to open up our hearts and our spirits and ask God to make a difference in our lives. You know, I really wanted to quit at about five till nine but obviously I didn't. But Satan is such a copycat. And I end with this. He is such an imposter. Do you know that our Lord Jesus Christ had three and a half years of ministry? Three and a half years of ministry from the time he was baptized to the time they nailed him to the cross was three and a half years. You know, the book of Revelation tells us that the Antichrist will be given seven years. But to end at the end of three and a half years, 42 months, his kingdom will be turned in to darkness. And just as darkness fell upon the day that Christ was crucified, at the end of three and a half years of a prosperous reign, you talk, about a, you talk about world peace, so they say. You talk about everybody eating all over the world. You talk, about, you, you talk about one world, one world. You talk about it. They're going to have it for three and a half years. But brother, at the end of that three and a half years, darkness is going to fall upon that kingdom. And the man that gave them the answer to peace and the man that gave them the answer to war and the man that gave them the answer to economics and all of that is going to be faced with the sun being turned into blood. He's going to be faced with lightning and hell, hell falling, uh, hell falling from the sky that weighs 120 pounds. He's going to be faced with all kinds of things. His answer will be Kill the Jews. That's his answer. Annihilate that one nation that will never give in. Annihilate the nation of Israel. That's the only thing that will break the curse. And friend, we know that when he gathers against Israel in the battle of Armageddon, we know that from that battle, they'll come riding from heaven the Lord Jesus Christ with a two-edged sword out of his mouth. We know that he'll defend Israel on that day. And we know that Israel on that day will look upon him whom they have pierced, the Bible say, it says. And this Bible says they'll be mourning throughout the nation of Israel as a man and woman mourns for their firstborn son that has been killed. And then they shall turn to the Lord. Tonight... I'm glad I've obeyed the mystery of godliness. Tonight, I'm glad I'm in a church and not a synagogue of Satan. Tonight, I'm glad I'm drinking from the Lord's cup, eating from the Lord's table, and not the table of devils. Tonight, I'm glad I'm serving the one who said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. If you're glad for that, could we stand for just a couple of moments and could we just thank the Lord tonight that we're in this church. We're in this glorious church. Come on all over this building. If you are a child of God tonight, all over this building, I want you to stand to your feet all over this building. If you're a child of God, 
I want you to lift your hands toward heaven and begin to thank God. Lord, I love you tonight. Lord, I praise you tonight. Lord, I magnify your name and glorify your name tonight. God, I'm in this church. I'm in this glorious church. I've been baptized in your name. I've been filled with your spirit. God, I'm striving to make a hundred. Ninety-nine and a half won't do. Lord, I've washed my robe in the blood of the Lamb. God, when I've got a spot on my robe, God, I've washed in your blood. For what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord, I praise you tonight, O God. Lord, I magnify your name tonight, Lord. God, be upon this church. God, be upon the people that have gathered here tonight. Lord Jesus, take us from this place, from not, but not from your sight. Lord, keep your hands upon us as we travel home. God, give us travel blessings as we go to our home. God, keep your hands upon us as we shine the light in Miraville. As we shine the light, oh God. Lord, bring us back to this place on Sunday morning. God, bring us back, Lord, ready to praise you and let, ready to worship you. For we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let's give him a hand of praise and you can dismiss yourself. In Jude, we find him writing in verse 3, I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.